this is not talked about so often. Uh, much has been made about, of course, things like the energy crisis, things like Ukraine's economic situation. But there hasn't been really in-depth analysis, at least from the perspective of where you two may come from with this question. So what do you feel like are the most important uh, uh, economic impacts of the Ukraine proxy war? And what has changed? And maybe we can start with Michael and then Radhika. Uh, you can follow up right after. Well, the whole purpose of the war is economic, uh, but it's not economic just about Ukraine and uh, the winners and losers of uh, the United States and Europe. Uh, President Biden has said this is a 10 or a 20 year war and it's for what kind of economy is the world going to have? Is it going to be a finance based neoliberal rentier economy centered in the United States? with the United States controlling uh, all of the monopoly rents uh, for, uh, for oil, for raw materials, for uh, technology, uh, for computer uh, information, for pharmaceuticals, or will other countries uh, have a chance to be independent? Uh, and Ukraine is just sort of the first uh, joust in this uh, long, long war, and it's over, over the economy. Everything that's happening right now is just sort of a squiggle over uh, uh, the really big picture, uh, which is how the world is going to be structured economically. Hold on, Absolutely. I, I, I think I'd just like to add that, you know, if you look at the biggest picture, basically the world is dividing, exactly as Michael says, into two. And what's really interesting <laughs> now compared to, you know, if you look back at the centuries long dominance of the West, which basically is coterminous with the rise of capitalism, in a certain sense, you're beginning to see its demise. Because if you look at the map of the world, um, it, of, of all the countries in the world that are imposing sanctions on Russia, that are supplying arms to Ukraine, etc., what you see is essentially the core of uh, world capitalism as it was in 1914 with a few little additions, very tiny, very insignificant, not very economically important. Whereas the entire rest of the world is going in the other direction and the divide between this West and the rest is growing precisely in the ways that Michael is saying, because the West is basically in a, has been in a long-term trend of decline, uh, but the Western leaders have continued to pursue the policies that are responsible for the decline because even though they are not good for the economy, they are great for the monopoly financialized corporations of the West, which, as Michael says, have become more and more reliant on rentier income, on rent and interest, rather than profits from production. The, so so that's, that's really the key. So it is dividing because basically, and this is happening even though so many countries are in the rest of the world, in the third world, etc., are not doing so well, thanks to the pandemic crisis, thanks to the economic difficulties created by the Ukraine war. But nevertheless, the one thing that, that is happening is that even though they may not be doing well, what they are beginning to realize is that the West has very little to offer them. And meanwhile, particularly China, and of course, given the energy situation, Russia may have a lot more to offer them, and they are beginning to exercise their national sovereignty um, and making choices which are actually not very favorable to continuing Western dominance. Well, that's the whole point. Uh, the war uh, in terms of the long perspective is how do we, pre how does the United States prevent other countries from uh, d developing their own sovereignty and from, from becoming independent of uh, the uh, de reliance on the United States for oil, for technology, for credit, for money, uh, for using the dollar, it, how does the U.S. prevent them? And uh, Ukraine is sort of just sort of the opening opening statement, saying uh, just as we're fighting to the last last Ukrainian, uh, if anybody else wants to go it alone, we can fight to the last Taiwanese, the last Japanese. Who wants to uh, be our ally? Yeah, it, well, let's let's bring in sanctions here because. You know, early on after Russia launched its special military operation, there was a flurry and they're still I mean, they're still piling on the sanctions as we speak. But the EU and the United States especially began to pile on sanctions onto Russia, made Russia the most sanctioned country in the world. 
and there was a lot made about the impact of these sanctions, especially on energy and the trade of energy, especially when it comes to Europe, since Europe depends a lot on Russian gas and Russian oil. What has been the impact of these sanctions? And uh, can, can you talk about this maybe historically over the course of the last year? Because it felt like there's been waves of various interpretations of how it would go. There was a lot of doomsday about it. There was a lot of kind of like Europe was going to be in big trouble. It seems like uh, there's been just a lot of various shifts in, in how this has gone for Europe and how this has gone for the world. What is your uh, what is your take on the impact of the sanctions, such a big economic weapon, uh, a part of this war? Well, we'd have to discuss sanctions on a region by region basis. Obviously, uh, the United States has become uh, the big winner in all of this in the sense that uh, the sanctions have turned Western Europe into a dependency. Uh, Western mm -hmm. Europe is now an economic colony. Uh, it's dependent on the United States for uh, oil and gas and uh, for fertilizer uh, for that is uh, so much more expensive uh, than uh, it, it was available in Russia that uh, German and uh, French and Italian industry are saying, well, in order to remain in business, we have to move uh, to the United States. They're not talking about moving to Russia or moving to other places, but the United States uh, has, uh, because of the sanctions, has solidified its uh, economic stranglehold uh, on Europe. Uh, the other, uh, the big winner of the sanctions next to the U.S. is, of course, Russia, uh, because uh, Russia, despite the fact that uh, President Putin uh, has wanted to break away from the neoliberal uh, philosophy, uh, he wasn't willing to impose protective tariffs and uh, to uh, uh, really uh, protect uh, Russian agriculture, Russian industry, Russian manufacturing. The sanctioning uh, basically has said, well, uh, we want to help you develop Russia, and uh, because you won't protect your agriculture like the common agricultural policy protected uh, the European uh, community, we're going to sanction you and we're going to force you to become independent, grow your own food, uh, we're going to force you to uh, produce uh, everything that you were dependent on the West before so that you won't need the West anymore, so that you can uh, work with uh, uh, China and Iran uh, and the rest of the world. We're really helping you be to become uh, independent from all of this. Uh, we'll, we'll take Europe. You won't have Europe anymore, but Europe isn't going to count for very much because it's sort of a dead zone now. Uh, so... Uh, basically, th there's been this uh, uh, this shift uh, of Russia eastward, and of course, the other the what's up for grabs, and I think what we should talk about in this show is what about uh, the uh, southern uh, uh, countries, the uh, South America, Africa, the rest of Asia mm -hmm. that's had its energy prices go up so far. Its food prices go up so much. Its uh, fertilizer prices go up so much. Uh, and the, uh, the U.S. dollar in which all of these goods are priced go up so much, what are they going to do? Are they going to essentially realize uh, that we're going to have to survive only by not repaying uh, the foreign debt, only by protecting our own agriculture, or are they going to succumb? That's the real uh, aim of the, uh, the war in uh, Ukraine. It's not fought over Ukraine. It's fought over Africa, South America, mm -hmm. and East Asia. You know, there's a lot of really good points there, Michael, and I, I would add a few things. I mean, you know, if you were to just say one word about the sanctions uh, which are imposed by the West, I would say that the word that simply describes what has happened as a result of sanctions is boomerang. You know, the sanctions were advertised as, you know, they're going to lay waste the Russian economy. It's going to make the basket case the big, you know, nuclear option of just freezing Russia's reserves is going to bring Russia to its knees. None of this has happened. Um, and I think this is really interesting to sit back and observe why that is so. Because, you know, if you look back at the history of sanctions, which goes back to the early days of the First World War, what you find is that basically the application of sanctions was a attempt to bring to Europe uh, and essentially an attempt to use everywhere else measures that had been used by imperial countries against their colonies to bring them to submission. But the fact of the matter is that we have come a long way from that world and even the relatively weaker economies of the world are not so easily 
damaged without inflicting damage on yourself. So mm -hmm. I would say that um, basically what, and of course, Russia is not at all a weak economy. Russia is not only a strong economy, but remember, given that the West has been imposing sanctions on Russia, at least in, since 2014, the Russians have become used to handling sanctions. Mm -hmm. They have become used to responding to sanctions by finding alternatives and by strengthening domestic production. So one really good example of this is that <clears throat> After the agricultural sanctions imposed on Russia in 2014 and, and later, basically, Russian agriculture has turned right around. It, Russia has, it has These sanctions have made Russia into a major agricultural exporter. <coughs> Excuse me. So... <coughs> So I would say that I agree, of course, with Michael, and I think Michael's done a great job of explaining this, you know, how much Europe is hurting. But the United States is also hurting. The inflation in the United States is in the, directly connected with the disruption of supply chains, which has to do with sanctions and so on and so forth. And generally speaking, the... <coughs> You see, the United States create, tried to create a world in which it could dominate, imposing on it various so-called globalization rules. But what's happening now is that the China, and particularly China, but a few other countries as well, are basically beating the U.S. at its own game. So the United States is now having to disrupt those rules and to impose sanctions and engage in protectionism. So I would say the U.S. is also a loser. I would also say one other thing about Europe, a couple of other things about Europe. Europe, you know, to this day, Europe and various European countries are applying sanctions selectively in ways that make a big bang, but the buck is small, so to speak. So, so you know, they don't lose that much. So, for example, today's headline, the Europeans still can't decide what sort of oil price cap to put on Russian oil, you know, because each country has different considerations and so on. But ne so, of course, so they're applying sanctions selectively. But yes, Europe is hurting. They have been helped a great deal by a mild winter. You know, everybody thought if the winter is bad, Europe is going to have a really tough time. But so, OK, there's a mild winter, but mild winter is not going to save Europe for a long time because these sanctions have forced Europe to uh, uh, buy more expensive gas. Right now, their, their coffers are full, their gas reserves are full, but a lot of people are saying that come next winter, that will be the real test of all this. Will they actually be able to continue with these cooperating with them, even appearing to cooperate with American sanctions as they seem to be doing right now? I would say, and remember also, all the major European countries know who blew up the Nord Stream pipeline, that the that the United States is so ruthless in its efforts to achieve the goals that Michael had just outlined, that they are willing to go as far as actually blow up a friendly country's infrastructure. So so that's what um, that's what you that's what you're looking at. And one final thing I'll say, you know, uh, in recent months, I think it's a couple of months since Merkel's interview has took place and everybody is telling us that Merkel said, oh, look at that. Merkel even said that, you know, we only uh, engaged in the Minsk Accords in order to buy time for Ukrainians. I have read the German version of that interview. Merkel does not say that. What Merkel says is, yes, in retrospect, Signing those accords gave Ukraine time, which is a very different statement from saying that we intended to do this, you know, to fool uh, uh, Russia all along. Because if that had been the case, why would Merkel have engaged in Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2, various other measures to make friendly relations with Russia? Remember, German-Russian, the, the, the desire to connect Germany to lands eastward, to Eastern Europe and Russia, goes back at least a century, if not more. Just the other day, I was reading about the so-called Dreikaiser Bund, which is the German, uh, the Austrian, and the um, the Austro-Hungarian and the Russian czars or, 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 or emperors would, would create a sort of alliance, which would actually make you know Germany unbeatable because Germany has all this technology plus you know you have all these resources or these big parts of the world so i don't think that these divisions are going to remain under water for long they are going to surface so we have gone on for a bit but the, uh, it's really important to remember that i think in the coming year the big headlines that everybody should be looking for is once the, the disruption of the much trumpeted unity of the west yeah, yeah. Well, all of those are 
are really good points. And, and I, I guess, you know, continuing on with this discussion of sanctions, it seems like you both outlined winners and losers and also kind of the dialectic between the two. You can both be a winner and you can be a loser. The United States seemingly fitting that description. But I wanted to ask you, what, what made Europe in the United States so confident about this form of economic warfare against Russia? Because we know it. there's 20 plus, 30 plus countries around the world that experience some form of sanctions imposed on them by the US, the EU, or some attendant institution connected to them. But at the same time, it seems like there was so much confidence that Russia was going to fall, that its economy would become a basket case, and therefore that would greatly facilitate the U.S.'s and the EU's goals when it came to this proxy war in Ukraine, which which was to destabilize Russia. What happened? Why why did that not happen? You touched a little bit on Radica, but maybe, Michael, if you want to take that question, then any other well, further reflections on that? How on earth can we explain how uh, Americans or anyone else make a mistake about uh, viewing the future? We can't explain the logic behind their mistake. There is no particular uh, logic behind it. The fact is, they didn't care about Russia. This isn't about Russia. They didn't care whether Russia would recover. The, uh, I think they've uh, sat down in Washington. They realize that uh, there's no way that they can prevent uh, what is happening now, uh, the Russia, China, Iran, India uh, uh, access from uh, developing. And they've decided what we're going to do is a holding operation. What can we hold? We can hold on to Europe. Uh, if we, the one of economic uh, effect of the war in Ukraine is to uh, completely disarm Europe. Europe has no more tanks, no more rifles, no more ammunition. It's a huge market now for American arms if uh, the uh, United States can uh, continue to keep the current uh, uh, European political leaders uh, in power. Uh, uh, the United States has solidified its hold on Europe, and it had hoped that by uh, uh, the sanctions would uh, put such an economic squeeze on uh, debtor countries, on uh, Latin America, Africa, and South Asia, that uh, they would be forced into higher reliance uh, on the dollar. So it's sort of a, a myth to think, yes, the, they say we'll, we'll uh, break up Europe. That's simply political talk into sell it in the United States. Uh, I, mean, I should have said uh, that they thought they'd break up Russia. Uh, they keep talking about dividing Russia into five or six countries, uh, but that's uh, so unrealistic that uh, you have to almost look at that as uh, a distracting patter talk. Uh, uh, they're looking at what they can absolutely hold on, and they're trying to hold on to the world outside of Russia, not uh, defeat Russia itself. It's a fight over uh, how America can uh, uh, control and uh, essentially dominate its allies, not uh, its non-allies. Yeah, I, I'd actually like to add a couple of points to that. I think one of the things that I'm always just struck by, you know, we've now been watching this conflict for nearly a year. And what I'm just amazed at is the extent to which the United States uh, is, you know, you talked about U.S. confidence, but I think U.S. confidence is itself a bit of a con. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that First of all, different parts of the U.S. state are pulling in different directions. Different parts of the Western alliance are pulling in different directions. And even so, so for example, you know, obviously there are, you know, the whatever confidence there may be that we may be looking at is basically a result of the pronouncements made by those who in whose material interest, you know, if you go to sort of go by the follow the money principle, in whose material interest the war is. So they, of course, want to sound totally confident that, yes, the war can be won, etc. Um, and of course, as you know, recently, there has been a RAND uh, 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 Corporation report, which RAND Corporation being very close to the US administration, etc., which has been uh, uh, interpreted in two very different ways. You know, the warmongers say the RAND Corporation says we have to continue this war and intensify it and prolong long it and so on and others are saying it means something completely different so I, I i think that what we have to realize is that the us is trying to achieve a whole range of conflicting objectives i think one is obviously to try and retain its purchase on world affairs try and retain its dominance on world affairs it's not succeeding 
but that's what the effort is about. Um, uh, but at the same time, the U.S. is also trying to, you know, it, it is also sort of uh, uh, trying to profit. So the military industrial complex is profiting. It's ma making money hand over fist, not only right now, but we are, we are, we should watch the coming U.S. budget because basically it looks as though the uh, the Pentagon and associated interests are going to use the Ukraine war as a way of essentially uh, uh, increasing um, the contracts being given to the five uh, major U.S. Uh, uh, corporations. You know, over the 20 years or 30 years since the end of the Cold War, what used to be dozens and dozens of military suppliers have become condensed into five. And you can imagine if there are only five, they, they, they find it very easy to talk to the American government government. So they are making money. They are going to get long term contracts under the guise of, you know, mm. uh, and obviously people like them want to prolong the Ukraine war. Um, but there are also a whole bunch of other things. The United States is also, for example, we are being told that the, a lot of the uh, uh, the U United States is aiding Ukraine. One of the things and, and in order to aid Ukraine, the United States has passed a new version of the Lend-Lease Act through which it had aided uh, 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 European countries during the First World War. But if you look more closely at the Lend-Lease Act, what you see very clearly uh, is the opposite of that. Basically, most people, when they hear the word aid, they think that the United States is giving money to Ukraine. It's not giving money to Ukraine. If you look at this text of the of the uh, uh, 2022 Lend-Lease Act that was passed and look at Clause 3, it says very clearly uh, the, there's a number three, which says condition. Yeah, if you read that, it says very simply, any loan or lease of the def uh, of defense articles to the government of Ukraine under paragraph one shall be subject to uh, all applicable laws um, concerning the return of and reimbursement and repayment for defense articles uh, loaned or leased to foreign governments. Ukraine is going to have to pay for this. Now, let me also tell you one other thing. In any such situation, as was the case in the First and Second World Wars, so it is now, the United States is profiting from wars very far away. The United States is also sending two kinds of weapons. Number one, obsolete weapons that it needs to get, uh, get rid of anyway. So this way, it gets to make money out of uh, 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 out of assets that it would have had to write off otherwise. Secondly, it wants to send those weapons which its military industrial complex corporations want to have tested in battle conditions. So in all of these ways, the United States, under the rhetoric of aid, is actually using Ukraine. It, I don't think it cares a farthing about what happens to Ukrainians, as Michael has also said and reminded us, and as John Mearsheimer keeps saying, the Americans want to fight the Ukraine war, the war against Russia to the last Ukrainian. So I think these sorts of things should give us an idea that different parts of the U.S. administration are pulling in different directions. As always, there are many pigs feeding at the trough, and they are all getting their bit. But in the meantime, the trough is Ukraine. They are emptying Ukraine. Well, let's uh, take that to the next step. You mentioned uh, the effect of Lend-Lease, uh, especially on England. Uh, in, uh, in the Second World War, uh, the Lend-Lease made England uh, uh, pay by uh, essentially uh, emptying out the sterling area reserves that India and other raw materials producers had put in London during the war. All this money that was uh, uh, accumulated by the British colonies uh, ended up opening up this, uh, uh, the sterling area to the United States, saying these countries can spend their money anywhere, not only in England. So there was a huge demand for the United, for the United States, and essentially uh, the Lend-Lease uh, broke the British Empire. Well, let's look at what's happening in Ukraine. Uh, how could uh, uh, Ukraine possibly repay more than $10 of uh, uh, the debt that it owes uh, for uh, the arms and others? Well, the idea is that obviously there's, uh, there's a reason that in the last couple of weeks, you've had uh, Blackstone going back and forth to Ukraine. You've had Blinken uh, go, uh, going around. You've had uh, George Soros talking. Uh, in the last, uh, uh, I guess, year of the war, uh, Ukraine has sold its farmland, its mineral resources. It's sold almost all of its 
uh, raw materials and agriculture to uh, American firms. Now, the problem is, how can a puppet government such as Zelensky actually have the authority to sell? Uh, you, you've had in the last week hilarious talks, uh, suggestions, uh, even in the Washington Post, by uh, supposed leaks saying that, well, the United States uh, State Department is willing to talk, uh, uh, talk to Russia to uh, make a, a settlement uh, on all of this. Uh, and maybe we're even willing to uh, give Russia uh, the uh, Luhansk and uh, the Donetsk uh, reasons, regions. Um, I can imagine what the discussion would be between the State Department and Russia. Uh, and uh, this, uh, Mr. Blinken would say, well, uh, uh, Russia, you can you can have these regions. It's okay if they're part of Russia now, but you have to respect the international private property rules, and you have to realize that the the uh, titanium resources in this region that uh, we need for our airlines, uh, the agricultural uh, land uh, uh, that's uh, so fertile that we need. Uh, to control the export trade, uh, that your oil and gas and all of your minerals have, have really been bought up by the Americans from uh, uh, m uh, Mr. Zelensky's uh, regime. Uh, are you willing to uh, uh, obey, obey the uh, rules-based order that says uh, we stole it fair and square? Well, obviously, Russia is not going to do this, and it's only a, uh, a ploy to pretend to Europe to pretend to the world that, yes, the United States is willing to give uh, uh, Luhansk and uh, the other uh, Donetsk uh, to Russia. Of course, it's even willing to let it uh, keep Crimea, but as, uh, Crimea, as long as uh, the United States uh, private sector owns uh, uh, mo most of this uh, property, which, of course, uh, is uh, inconceivable uh, in, in principle.